I don't know how many powerful people will be held accountable in this never-ending saga, but last week, three indictments were unsealed by the state grand jury, and Russell Lafitte, Corey Fleming, and Alec Murdoch were hit with several charges related to the Hakeem Pinckney case, and that is a big deal. My name is Mandy Matney. I have been investigating the Murdoch family for more than three years now. This is the Murdoch Murders Podcast with David Moses and Liz Farrell. Wow. So we had a busy week since our last podcast. On Monday, we found out Bowen Turner was arrested again, and this time he was denied bond. We will get into that at the end of this episode as it definitely plays into this theme of accountability among the good old boys. So on Wednesday, the same day that our podcast episode named How Many People Will Go Down For This aired, the South Carolina Attorney General's Office announced three superseding indictments against Alec Murdoch, his best friend Corey Fleming, and his banker buddy Russell Lafitte. But before we get into all of that, I want to talk about a tweet by David Haskins that really stuck out to me in the last few weeks. The tweet said, I hope the Beach family finds comfort in that their pursuit of justice for Mallory has helped lead to justice and restoration for so many other families too. Wow. It isn't every day where a kingdom publicly crumbles like this. To see three very powerful men, two former attorneys and a former bank CEO, get indicted for crimes where they allegedly took advantage of people who had less power than them, that is a big deal. And it's something we should stop and think about. All of these people are going down and all of these investigations are happening right now because of Mallory Beach. Because people loved her so much and said enough is enough. Because her mother was brave enough to file a lawsuit when she felt she wasn't going to get answers or accountability without it. It is horrible that so many people, including Mallory, had to die for these ruthless crimes to be exposed. But I want everyone to know that we will make sure none of their deaths were in vain. So let's talk about these indictments. First of all, the indictments were handed down on April 14th, but the Attorney General's office didn't make the announcement until May 4th. This is sticky because attorneys in this state will make the point that there's nothing unusual about what happened here. They'll also say we don't know anything about the law, and this is why we have an issue with something they see as just the way it works here. Obviously, we understand that indictments can be sealed for multiple reasons, especially when we're talking about a criminal conspiracy and seemingly countless related investigations. Here's the thing, though. We know about the intense negotiating that goes on behind the scenes in terms of high-priced defense attorneys seemingly calling the shots when their client gets arrested. Now, if the indictments are unsealed too soon, the public knows about them and then wonders, well, gee, why isn't this guy in jail? In Paul Murdoch's 2019 boat crash case, he never went to jail before or after his hearing. Dick Harputlian and Jim Griffin went to great lengths and some people seemed to bend over backward to get Paul processed in the courtroom after the hearing. And this counted as his quote unquote arrest. This is what we're taking an issue with. Sure, it's normal that someone like Russell Lafitte, who has the means to hire the best, can hold off on going to jail until just hours before his hearing. We're saying it shouldn't be normal. So our issue isn't with the length of time it took to unseal the indictments in this case. It's with what we believe to be one of the possible reasons, and that's to minimize the time between when the public finds out about the indictment and when an arrest is made. Remember, Fitz News had been hearing since January that 
Russell Lafitte's indictment was imminent. According to our sources, Russell had been making preparations for this eventuality for a while. On April 11th, literally three days before he was indicted, Russell put his house on the market, the one that was described as having a, quote, secret children's playroom, which is a really weird thing to say a house has. On April 28th, it seemed like Russell was even able to sneak in what could actually end up being his final turkey hunt. But this is a problem. Two weeks earlier, he was indicted for allegedly stealing $1.8 million from very vulnerable people in very tragic situations. But he's still able to be out having a good old time for himself? Photos of him after the hunt were posted on Facebook and featured him grinning away as if nothing was wrong. Again, everyone has the right to be considered innocent until proven guilty. Our question isn't about his guilt or innocence though. It's about the deals that we know get made outside the public process that result in good old boys like Alec, Russell, and Corey getting treated much better than 99% of people accused of committing crimes. As of today, Corey hasn't even been arrested on his new charges in his second and third indictments, meaning Corey is now accused of defrauding three people. This is important because Corey's main defense, and Russell's too, is that they were tricked by Ellick, and this does not appear to be a fool me once situation. When Ellick was arrested in October of last year, it was a surprise to everyone. Sled was not messing around. They went down to Florida and they extradited him back to South Carolina. This meant he didn't have the chance to flee if leaving the country was on his mind. And he didn't have the chance to commit any more alleged crimes. When the receivership was appointed in November, it meant Ellick and his family were stopped from potentially hiding or degrading his assets. Based on Russell's and Corey's indictments, it looks like they too might have had a lot of reasons to hide information or even to flee. So those turkey hunting photos aren't just showing a man having fun, they're showing a man who is free and easy to do whatever it is he might need to do to improve his future. All three of the indictments handed down in mid-April were superseding indictments. This means that all three of the indictments that were previously handed down were updated, adding Russell to all three and Corey to two of them, as well as adding new charges for Ellick and Corey. Russell Lucius Lafitte now faces 21 charges of conspiring with Ellick Murdoch to steal nearly $2 million including hundreds of thousands of dollars in settlement money from the family of Hakeem Pinckney. Here is attorney Justin Bamberg, who is representing the Pinckney family. When we first heard of the indictments, it was it was bittersweet. It was a mix of emotion. I think there was excitement because, you know, we had been waiting. We knew that uh, there were certain things in the file that didn't look right. There were questionable checks and transactions. There were certain people's signature on certain documents. And, you know, we were just patiently waiting, like, what is going to happen? Like, is are we going to see justice come in the form of accountability in the criminal justice system? And it happened. You know, I, I'm, I was more excited for Ms. Pinckney because there's a degree of, thank God, the system is finally working for me. Which sounds really crazy because they were involved in those underlying accidents and all the pain and, and all the trauma and, and everyone is familiar with that. But the system was supposed to work for them over a decade ago and it didn't. Now here you are with all these old wounds reopened and now you see the system working for you. And uh, I was very happy for, for Ms. P. As you know, Hakeem was a deaf man who became quadriplegic in a 2009 car crash. He died mysteriously in 2011 after his respirator became unplugged. Hakeem died four days after Ellick settled his car crash case. Another attorney from PMPD who specializes in medical malpractice cases handled a wrongful death case for Hakeem's estate. But using his position of trust and as a representative of the bank, Russell Lafitte first served as Hakeem's conservator and then, after Hakeem died mysteriously, he served as a personal representative of Hakeem's estate. He obviously was impressed with the work he did for Hakeem because he paid himself handsomely from Hakeem's settlement money. Also in more trouble were Ellick, who was indicted on four additional charges in Hakeem's case, as well as the case of Arthur Badger, and Corey Fleming, 
who, like we said, is now accused of bilking a second victim, Hakim, and a third victim, Hakim's cousin, Natasha Thomas, for which he faces an additional five charges. Two of the three indictments focus on the Pinckney car crash. We did a deep dive into the Hakeem Pinckney story in episode 28 on January 19th. If you haven't listened to it already, we recommend you to go back and listen. It was one of the hardest and the most emotional episodes we've ever done. There are so many victims in this case, and so many storylines, and the details can sometimes get lost in the crowd. But the details are especially important in this case because it's now much more clear that Ellick's alleged criminal business model for the Gloria Satterfield scheme was built long before her death in 2018. In the Hakeem Pinckney episode, we mentioned that the Pinckney family's attorney, Justin Bamberg, was looking into whether or not money was stolen from Hakeem, his mother, and his cousin. The state grand jury was also looking into this, and obviously, two days after our episode in January, Ellick was indicted for allegedly helping himself to some of their money. This is a complex situation, though, and Justin is continuing to investigate the potential damage. Here is what he's found so far. You know, after Tom, we of course had documents associated with the underlying wreck case that led to Hakeem becoming a quadriplegic. Um, and after a while, we, we did obtain a copy of his file for the nursing home death case. And there were a couple of red flags that jumped out at us almost immediately. And one of them is, is pretty disturbing. Uh, and we are still investigating, trying to get down to the bottom of it. Uh, but we obtained a copy of the medical billing statement for Hakeem for treatment tied to his death and this indicated that providers had billed X amount. Medicaid obviously never pays all the bills. They pay a portion and then they assert a lien, right? And that's why if you look at his wrongful death settlement approval petition, it references $50,000 being withheld to account for a lien. These are public documents. The problem is, is the numbers don't match up because the disbursement of the monies don't indicate 50000 being withheld or paid to a lien holder. What the disbursement indicates is that $183,000 in change is what went to Medicaid. But Medicaid had only spent 46000 bucks according to the documents that we've seen. So we're investigating to find out exactly how much did Medicaid get, what exactly went on, and did Alec Murdoch make, up, make off with more money or not? Um, and hopefully we'll find out the answer soon. You know, every time you look at anything tied to that man, tied to, tied to Alec Murdoch, you've got to use a microscope because the devil really is in the details. And, and that's one of the difficulties of getting answers for these victims is sometimes things are not what they seem. When you just look on paper, you've got to look through the paper. And uh, yeah, all I can say about that. This should all sound very familiar. We saw a lot of these same things in the Gloria Satterfield case. However, it appears that Palmetto State Bank, specifically the son of its CEO at the time, Russell Lafitte, was a lot more involved in the Pinckney case than they were in the Satterfield case. In fact, as you remember, Russell seems to have passed on the opportunity to serve as personal representative in the Satterfield case and gave it to his vice president, Chad Wessendorf, who put the I don't know in fiduciary. Here is a breakdown of what investigators say Russell, Corey, and Alec stole from the Pinckney family. The three allegedly worked together to take more than $350,000 from Natasha Thomas's trust. That's Hakeem's cousin. Russell and Alec are accused of stealing nearly $310,000 from Hakeem Pinckney's estate. And by the way, they did this on December 21st, 2011, which is two months after Hakeem died and four days before the very first Christmas the Pinckney family would spend without their loved one. Alec and Corey allegedly conspired to take almost $90,000 from Pamela Pinckney's accounts. 
And guess what Corey is accused of doing with about $8,000 of Miss Pamela's money. He appears to have treated himself, Alec and another attorney, and we're trying to figure out who that was, with a luxurious trip to Omaha, Nebraska on a private airplane to attend the 2012 College World Series. It is sickening to picture Alec, Corey, and whoever this mysterious guest is living the high life on the backs of people who just lost so much. So the same moves that were pulled on Hakeem, and again, remember, this is one of the most disturbing things about this entire situation, is when the case settled, Hakeem was alive, and he was deaf, and he was quadriplegic in his nursing home. Miss P was looking forward to doing what she had to do to bring him home. That's why she authorized the settlement in the first place. Bring, I need to bring my boy home. Before these checks get cut, Hakeem is already dead. You see what I'm saying? Hakeem, unfortunately, had already passed away. None of these checks should have been cut in the first place. Right, there's a process by which, and I have unfortunately been in a situation myself with clients before I had a client and we got his case done and the money's on the way and unfortunately the client dies. You don't just get to go and cut checks. Again, that's not how this works. We have laws in the state, there are rules and processes and procedures, and at that point, money's got to go to his estate. The conservatorship that was previously established dies with Hakeem literally dies with Hakeem. Last week, we gave you a rundown on some of Justin's findings in the Pinckney case and some of the unorthodox ways the two are accused of spending Pinckney's money, including a check for $100,000 to Russell's father, Charlie, a $10,000 check to Maggie Murdoch, more than $300,000 to Ellick's father, and our former solicitor, Randolph Murdoch III. We have not been kidding you when we tell you just how complex the Murdoch investigation is. Finally, the last accusation in the latest indictments says that Russell and Ellick conspired to steal nearly $1.2 million from an Allendale man named Arthur Badger, whose case we'll tell you more about in a future episode. So far, Ellick faces 82 charges. 79 from his alleged financial crimes, and three from the shooting incident. He's accused of stealing around $9 million so far. He faces more than 700 years in prison. Corey was first indicted in March on 18 charges related to his alleged role in the Gloria Satterfield case. He stands accused of stealing almost $4 million from two sets of clients. He faces up to 207 years in prison. Again, Russell is accused of stealing almost $2 million. He faces up to 140 years in prison. Do you guys ever think about the co-conspirators who haven't been publicly identified yet? I definitely do. I imagine them sitting at home, bouncing their legs right now, and jumping every time their phone buzzes. Is this it? Have they found out yet? If we've learned anything from this last set of indictments, beyond the fact that some people seem to be able to schedule their arraignments like their Botox appointments, it's that there has been such a profound lack of accountability in South Carolina for so long that these guys didn't seem to take the time to cover their tracks. And if they did, it wasn't until the writing was on the wall for them. Which means Alec and Russell are basically the Hansel and Gretel of Hampton County, leaving breadcrumbs that are leading police to all their friends' gingerbread houses, which were built with stolen cookies. I mean this with all sincerity. We hope every single person involved in taking money from people is identified and has to answer publicly for their actions. And I cannot stress this enough. I sure do hope they can shed some light on where all this allegedly stolen money went. Because here's the thing. That handful of lawyers who seem to jump at the chance to tell Mandy and me that we don't understand the law, and that's why we're seeing problems in the system, they're usually the same ones who also try to say that white-collar crime are not as bad as violent crimes, which is, I don't even know where to start with that. Really, stealing money isn't the same as murdering a human being. I had no idea. Thank goodness I asked about that. To us, the question is simple when it comes to white collar crimes. 
Did you hurt someone in exchange for your personal enrichment? Did you try to create a better life for yourself using money that was not yours? Because taking advantage of someone who might not be aware that you're doing it in order to steal from them is hurting them. It's kind of like this. When you put money in savings, the bank gives you a percentage of interest, right? It's tiny. In fact, for most of us, it's not even all that noticeable. We're basically lending the bank our money in exchange for the convenience of spending it. But if we borrow the money from the bank, well, my God, they sure do make a lot of money off of that, right? Well, here's the test for anyone in favor of a lighter hand of justice for white collar criminals. If proportionally someone they trusted and someone they were paying to do a job for them after they or their loved ones were in a catastrophic accident, stole the same amount of their money that Ellick, Russell, and Corey are accused of stealing from the victims, would they be like, oh geez, why is everyone getting so up in arms? It's just money. It's not like it's murder. No, in fact, the proof is in the pudding. Just last week, Ellick's attorneys were in court stomping their hooves on the ground in an effort to regain control over Ellick's assets. Why? Oh my gosh, because it's not fair to Ellick, of course. Ellick deserves his money. Back to my savings account example. When the lawyers or their friends are taking the money, it's met with a shrug and a get over it. But when it's the lawyer's money or their friend's money, will everyone get ready for a tantrum? So maybe they believe white collar crimes should be treated differently from violent crimes. Over here, we just don't. Because this is apparently 1% of the bigger picture, and just look at the damage they've done, allegedly. At the very end of the day, every knee shall bow. And what's done in the dark will often come to the light, and it may take time in this instance. This took 11 years, but it happened. You know, and the only thing I can think of, you know, is... <laughs> I mean, think about it. What's worse, doing doing some stupid stuff and getting caught right after you do it, or doing it and thinking that your life has moved on and it's ten years later and you whether you're still doing what you the failures you previously had or not, it come back to bite you. That's probably harder than getting caught right when it happens. You know, you think about them people who, you know, and you read about them. You know, you read about that person who like that. All of a sudden, there's this solved murder from 40 years ago, and the person who gets charged for it, like literally has a whole new life and just figured that it would never come up. And all of a sudden, <laughs> 40 years later, off the prison you go, buddy, you've been caught, right? I mean, you never know. That's why you gotta keep your nose clean, do things the right way, and it ain't hard. Like that's the most, the dumbest thing about this entire ordeal is it's not hard to be a decent person. And we'll be right back. So that leads us to the bond hearing. On Thursday morning, Russell Lafitte appeared before Judge Allison Lee for his bond hearing. That hearing was virtual. Russell was cuffed and wearing a green jumpsuit for the bond hearing. He apparently turned himself in Friday morning at the Kershaw County Detention Center. Kershaw County is about 30 minutes from the Richland County Courthouse. It is not clear why Russell turned himself in there, but it's likely because of staffing issues at the Alvin S. Glenn Detention Center, where Ellick is, or because of the current jail population there. That jail apparently has a lot of trouble beyond Ellick Murdoch. Lafitte hired a powerful legal team, including former U.S. attorney Bart Daniel and Matt Austin. Hiring a former U.S. attorney indicates that Russell might be anticipating federal charges as well. Ostensibly, he likely hired Daniel for his abilities and his influence. He's highly respected in South Carolina and, by the way, was involved in prosecuting defendants caught up in Operation Jackpot in the 1980s. Go back to episode 31 to hear more about Jackpot. At times, Russell appeared super casual about the situation. In his hearings, Alec looked like inmate emeritus, someone completely at ease in his scrubs and his bloody knuckles, but who'd also like to get out of there if that's an option. But if not, no big deal. He has his meat sticks. Corey looked utterly furious at his bond hearing, which is a good facial expression to have when you want a room full of people to believe that you've been hustled by your best friend and now your running schedule has been interrupted. Russell had a totally different vibe. It was kind of like he was trying to act casual while hiding his frustrations that he had to wait an hour or so before bonding out. Creighton Waters spoke first. 
He told the court key details of the state's case against Russell Lafitte. Uh, in total, uh, Your Honor, between the three indictments, uh, we have 15 counts of breach of trust, 10,000 uh, or more, three counts of computer crime, 10,000 or more, and three counts of criminal conspiracy. Uh, the total charges are 21. Uh, all of these are felonies, Your Honor. Uh, and the total amount of exposure is up to 170 years. Uh, and the total alleged amount, which I'll describe at the appropriate time, uh, is uh, about $1.8 million in alleged fraud. Attorney Matt Austin was next to speak. Austin argued his client should be released on his own recognizance or a 10% cash bond. Mr. Lafitte is um, a good candidate for um, for release. He is uh, he presents no danger to the community. Um, there's no um, threat of violence implicated in any of the charges that he has been charged with. He is um, these are all financial crimes. Um, to the extent he has had um, or would have any ability to carry out similar crimes as alleged, um, it would require him to still be working at the bank. He no longer works there, so that's not even possible. He's a lifelong resident of Hampton County. Um, in fact, he's never lived outside of South Carolina at all and has no intention to. Um, uh, besides going to Newberry College, where he graduated in 1997, he's lived in Hampton his entire life. Um, and he has substantial and strong ties to the community. Um, with us today is his wife, Susie, of 21 years. Um, his daughter, who's um, a college student, um, he has a son at home as well, who just actually turned 17 today. So we're hoping he can get back for his birthday. Um, and his sister, Gray, is here as well. She also lives in Hampton. Imagine that this was happening on the day of his son's 17th birthday. If this was the move, by the way, for Russell to check into jail on his son's birthday, brilliant. Because it made Russell look like he got mercilessly plucked from the warm and fuzzy comfort of dad life by the cold-hearted state. It also reminded the room that Russell had family who loved him enough to keep track of him. And if they didn't get that message from the birthday announcement, they had visuals to prove it. Russell's family showed their support from a conference room with his attorneys. Frankly, their presentation was not as good as the one Corey's attorney, Debbie Barbier, had created for his remote family support experience. She looked like the captain of a ship that was filled with very concerned passengers. Russell's attorneys somehow managed to make it look like he'd been called into HR and was about to be fired for his browsing history. And uh, Mr. Lafitte is extremely active in the community, um, given the nature of his prior uh, job you know it's a community bank and he is very involved in his community he's a member um, of the rotary club of hampton uh, he was the previous vice chair of the hampton county disabilities and special needs board uh, previous member of the hampton county economic development board uh, he's a member of all saints Episcopal church and he's he served as uh, treasurer at one point as well um, uh, again he, is, he has no ties to anywhere outside of south carolina that would um, warrant him being deemed a flight risk at all. All of his ties are very firmly uh, in here in the state. And so um, uh, he has zero criminal record. Um, he has uh, his, no, there's no danger of him not appearing for court. He has cooperated with the um, investigation from the outset, actually prior to our being retained in the case, actually, he uh, willfully has been interviewed. Uh, he has shown up every time we've asked him to show up. And he, um, we, you know, he turned himself in this morning. There's been zero problem. And so for all those reasons, Judge, we think that he'd be appropriate for, for uh, release on bail. His attorneys didn't know it yet, but Creighton Waters brought a big bag of their breadcrumbs with him to the hearing. I also want to point out that while this case is related to Alec Murdoch, um, Mr. Lafitte is a different person uh, than Alec Murdoch. However, uh, what the allegations are here and what we see is there's a long association between Mr. Russell Lafitte and Alec Murdoch. There's a long association between uh, their families uh, as very prominent families in Hampton County. And Mr. Uh, Lafitte, um, as he just stated, has served uh, uh, 24 years at Palmetto State Bank, which is a local bank uh, headquartered there. Uh, he was the vice president of loans for an extended period of time. He was the COO. And up until his termination, he was the CEO. So a uh, long time in senior leadership in that bank. Uh, Your Honor, of course, has also heard uh, of the string of financial allegations against uh, Alec Murdaugh. And, and what we uh, have seen from that is a 
exhausting uh, sort of velocity of money uh, over many, many years uh, on behalf of Mr. Murdoch. Um, and in addition to anything that he might legitimately earn, he constantly had to beg, borrow, and allegedly steal uh, to stay afloat. And an important cog um, in that hamster wheel constantly spinning uh, was his friend at Palmetto State Bank, uh, that being Russell Lafitte. It's important that Creighton Water said this because this is law enforcement acknowledging that both Russell and Palmetto State Bank played a key role in this heist. Waters then explained the details of the scheme. Uh, but ultimately, what he also was doing was loaning six-figure figures of money uh, to Alec. Uh, and these uh, loans uh, from the children's money uh, kept Alex afloat. They were off the books um, from the bank. Uh, weren't disclosed to the bank. And of course, Mr. Lafitte has got to make sure that those get paid back because he is conservator is responsible for those. Ultimately, Alec gets Mr. Lafitte appointed uh, in fiduciary responsibility for the victims we have here. And that would be Ms. Pamela Pinckney, uh, her now deceased son, Hakeem Pinckney, um, their relative, Natasha Thomas, all of whom are represented by uh, Justin Bamberg, uh, as well as um, Arthur Badger, Uh, and he's represented by Mr. Mark Tinsley. Here, Creighton was describing the checks that we told you about in our last episode. Five six-figure payments, quote, used in the manner to give the illusion of regular payments that are used to pay back the loans that Mr. Lafitte had given Alec from the conservatorship, end quote. He said that ultimately, quote, there's about $1.8 million in alleged fraud that comes from this alleged scheme, and we have 21 felonies to date as it relates to this ongoing investigation. Finally, Creighton Waters made an interesting comment about Lafitte's alleged cooperation. Uh, Mr. Austin Mission's cooperation, uh, the most I will say about that is Mr. Lafitte has given statements, and I'll just leave it at that. Prosecutor Creighton Waters made a point to say this, that Russell hasn't been involved in a two-way conversation with law enforcement, at least not in a way that's been helpful. Providing statements in certain documents, especially after you've been caught in the middle of a scheme such as this one, a scheme that has a clear paper trail, does not in any way absolve you from the crime. The prosecution ultimately asked for a surety bond of $25,000 per felony, which is about a $500,000 bond. He also asked that there would be no contact with the victims or bank employees. Attorney Justin Bamberg, representing the Pinckney family, spoke after Waters. He argued that even though this is a nonviolent crime, what happened to the Pinckney family was horrific. Um, there are victims. Uh, and, and to truly understand that, Your Honor, I, I think the court needs to know what happened to them. Um, you know, this was a very, very, very horrible accident. It actually left Mr. Hakeem Pinckney um, a quadriplegic in a nursing home. Uh, and it is important to note that uh, some of the money that was misappropriated was actually done after the young man had suffocated to death in the nursing home. Um, and he effectively became brain, brain dead. Um, and, and the reason I mention that, Your Honor, is um, some may say there's, there's no threat of violence. Speaking to danger to the community, uh, Mr. Lafitte does have access to firearms uh, per social media. It appears that uh, just seven days ago, he was out turkey hunting. Um, I mean, it's not as simple uh, because it's white collar or stolen money. Um, the callousness that, that was displayed with regards to what the victims were going with at the time, I think, is indicative of, of being a danger to the community or uh, not caring about uh, what happened to somebody or what was going on in their life. Um, as to flight risk. Ah, the turkey pictures on social media that Liz mentioned earlier. Justin makes a great point. It's not just about the turkeys. It's about how Lafitte clearly has access to guns and clearly knows how to use them. Justin also mentioned that Russell Lafitte put his house on the market on April 11th. And as far as the victims know, they have no idea. They, they live in these communities and they have no idea where he does intend to reside or whether he intends to, to go somewhere else. But if you're going to sell your house, you obviously don't intend to live there. Um, so we would, we would raise that to the court. 
Well, Ms. Murphy also has access to friends and associates, uh, for example, who have access to private planes. Uh, some of the money that was misappropriated from these individuals was used by uh, apparently some of his friends and associates to fly to Omaha, Nebraska. Finally, Justin Bamberg argued that Russell Lafitte is a wealthy person who can afford basically any bond. Uh, but he has the ability to pay any any bond set by the court. Um, Mr. Lafitte owns 9% of the shares in Palmetto State Bank. That is 23,365 shares of a bank that has a value of over $700 million. Uh, so any bond, even if the, even if your honor uh, made bond equal to the dollar amount of the monies that were misappropriated from the victims, he still would have the ability to pay it. Uh, so your honor, we ask that uh, the bond amount given ensure that Mr. Lafitte does not run um, and ensure that uh, Mr. Lafitte has a vested interest in, in sticking around. Um, and that would be the statement on behalf of the victim, Your Honor. Thank you so much for uh, allowing me to speak on their behalf. Matt Austin, Russell Lafitte's attorney, quickly responded to Justin's speech, and he made jokes. You know, Mr. Lafitte likes to hunt, and um, if, there may be some danger to local turkeys, but there's no, there's no indication that he is a danger to anybody else in the community. He hasn't been charged with doing anything that's physically violent. I know we sometimes make jokes on this podcast, but we're not the ones sitting on a remote screen in a courtroom with handcuffs on and in a jumpsuit that makes us look like Kermit the Frog's mechanic. There may be some danger to local turkeys is definitely retirement speech material. Oh, wait. Yeah, it's just, um, it's, I, I can't think of a case with less risk um, for, for a defendant to have, uh, have any, any concerns like that. Um, with regard to his cooperation with law enforcement as well, he said, um, uh, I would I respectfully disagree with Mr. Waters' um, characterization as just statements. Um, Mr. Lafitte has met with the DAG's office, the U.S. Attorney's office, the FBI, SLED, and um, has, has been grilled, um, has answered questions, has um, provided statements, but also answers and clarified things and provided helpful information for law enforcement. And so I think it goes beyond mere statements. Um, again, it's not worth quibbling over, you know, it's worth noting because it, it shows you where his, where he is mentally in this whole process. He's not trying to um, hide from anything. And that, that speaks to another point in all of this as well that is just, I think, interesting with these facts is that he was appointed um, with the court's permission to be conservator. And so many of these filings that, um, are used and, and referred to throughout this process, they haven't been um, located through in some safety deposit box somewhere and, and squirreled away. They've been in court. And so to the extent he's trying to get away with crimes, um, he is doing so by putting his own name, not other people's names, on documents and filing them with the court. So um, if he were to continue to commit crimes in that way, then I would think there'd be a pretty good paper trail for the government. So I just don't think there's any risk of him engaging in that kind of conduct. And then Creighton Waters was like, Your Honor, if I may, would you like some more breadcrumbs? Your Honor, that money uh, that he promptly took down when things started to fall apart and things started to come to light. And again, this always, always will work for a really long time as long as people trust and they don't look at what the documents say and what's really going on. Uh, my distinction between cooperation and statements has to do with content. And I'll leave it at that. Uh, the money that Mr. Lafitte uh, promptly took uh, once uh, things started to come to light and he knew light would start to shine on him, well, it wasn't out of his personal funds. It was out of the funds of the bank. So, Your Honor, I, I, I would question how much credit I would give him for that. Uh, we want to talk about his statements. You know, one of the things uh, that he mentioned uh, in his uh, statements was how, uh, you know, he liked to boat to the Bahamas. Uh, so he has uh, the ability and the access to do that. I'm honestly trying to picture a scenario where Russell would put that fun fact about boating in the Bahamas in a statement to police. 
But anyways, Waters added that the charges are serious and the court needs to issue a substantial bond to ensure both the safety of the community and to make sure he shows up for court. He pointed out that Russell put his house up for sale, which could be an indication that he has no plans or reason to stay in the area, and he was trying to liquidate his assets quickly. Although, the general consensus seems to be that Russell put his house on the market to raise money to pay for his attorneys, but Russell's lawyers actually told the judge Russell was selling his house to raise money for the victims, which is interesting because we thought he said he was tricked in all of this. Wouldn't that make them Alex victims in this case? And wouldn't that mean that Russell didn't steal anything and therefore has nothing to pay back? There's one bright side in Russell's lawyers putting that on the record. Here's Justin Bamberg. The information that is out and the, the information that has been talked about is very, very disheartening in terms of the failures of people who are supposed to have these folks back and the breaches of duties, the fiduciary duties. Uh, and, and it's a lot of them, you know, and it is very disheartening. And we're going to see what the system does and, and what the prosecutors do with the case. Um, but I can say this. I was pleased to hear this, as was um, the Pinckney's, when one of the criminal lawyers for Mr. Lafitte actually said at the bond hearing, one reason Mr. Lafitte was trying to sell that home and some other stuff was to try and make it right with victims or whatever. And that was very positive to hear. Back to the bond hearing. Judge Lee ordered a $1 million surety bond for Lafitte with house arrest when he post bail. Here were her reasons for that. Well, he is a respected member of the community and he has not posed any physical threat to any person. Um, there are allegations that he engaged in behavior um, that would be less than honorable. Um, and, uh, and potentially criminal, um, depending on the view of the evidence, once the jury has the opportunity to hear it. Um, uh, so uh, uh, I, I think that he does have the ability to be able to flee while he may not be inclined to do so. Um, the, the fact of the matter are, uh, is that there's very serious allegations that are pending him, uh, against him. Uh, many of them carry uh, multiple years of uh, incar potential for incarceration. Um, and uh, while um, it's not always uh, a desire for someone to, to leave the state, oftentimes that does occur. Uh, and so that, that hints my reason for house arrest with electronic monitoring, and he may not leave the state. Per the conditions of his bond, Russell Lafitte will be required to surrender his passport and will be electronically monitored while under house arrest. He is also barred from conducting any banking business. Lee also froze Lafitte's assets. Lafitte posted bond later Friday afternoon. Let's hope that the state does a better job tracking the whereabouts of Lafitte's ankle monitor than they did with Bowen Turner. And speaking of that, we'll be right back. So now we need to talk about the Bowen Turner case. I have to be honest, what happened this week made me both angry and terrified. And frankly, I'm so relieved I'm not sitting here telling you about another girl's life being ruined or worse. So 19-year-old Bowen Turner, who was accused of raping three girls between 2018 and 2019, was arrested Sunday evening in his hometown of Orangeburg County, South Carolina. On Mother's Day evening, an Orangeburg County Sheriff's Office deputy reportedly found Bowen stumbling around the middle of a road and reeking of booze. Sources told Fitz News that earlier that evening, he bought more than $100 of booze at a local bar and repeatedly tried to get a female employee at the bar to give him a ride home. When a deputy found him, Turner originally claimed he was visiting Tad's, a local bar about three miles from his house, but later he claimed he came from the woods. It's important to note here that two of the three teen girls who Turner is accused of raping each said they were assaulted in the woods late at night while Bowen was drinking. 
Late Sunday evening, Bowen Turner was charged with public disorderly conduct. He was taken to the detention center where he reportedly threatened to bite the finger off of a deputy. He could face more charges. Though the Orangeburg County Public Index indicated that Turner received and posted a surety bond of about $250, which was set by County Magistrate Derek Dash, he was still detained until Monday afternoon for a hearing related to his second charge of violating his probation. During that hearing, Judge Mary Williamson told the court that she considered Bowen Turner to be a danger to the community and she denied bond on the probation violation charge. It is not lost on us that a female judge made this crucial decision to choose public safety over the good old boys. According to our sources, Turner is being held without bond at the detention center until June 8th when a hearing is scheduled in his probation violation case. It is not known if State Senator Brad Hutto is still representing him. During the hearing, Turner apparently argued that he should be released because this was the first time he violated his probation, and he said that he never missed a court date prior. One of my sources told me he came across as entitled and showed no empathy. Here's the thing. Exactly one month before this incident, Judge Markley Dennis sentenced Bowen to five years probation after he pled guilty to assault and battery in Chloe Bess's case. It was the sweetheart deal of a lifetime considering the charges that were stacked against him. And in less than one month, Bowen Turner predictably proved to everyone that he was not a defendant who deserved the benefit of the doubt. He could not stay out of trouble for one month. While this is incredibly disturbing, there are two bright spots. One is that it was validating for the victims and their families who despite the pressures they have faced at great personal risks to themselves have pushed hard to get our state's justice system to see that they have made a big mistake here. And two, thank God it was just public disorderly conduct because there are very legitimate concerns that prosecutor David Miller, Judge Dennis, and Brad Hutto had inadvertently conspired to put the community in danger. And with the spotlight of the national press shining bright on Orangeburg County, the good old boys could no longer protect their prodigal son. And for now, at least until his hearing on June 8th, he will be in jail where he can't hurt any girls. But I don't want to talk about Bowen right now. I want to talk about all of the people who helped him get here. People who should be very, very relieved that the woman at the bar didn't take Bowen home Sunday evening. I want to be clear about something here. Every single person who has normalized Bowen's bad behavior over the last few years, every person who supported him and bullied his victims and their families, every person who drank at his parties, who gave him a pass, who served him booze underage and hung out with him like everything was fine, you are the problem. I have seen a couple people making excuses for his parents. People saying things like there is only so much a 19 year old's parents can do to control him. No, these parents allegedly threw a party for him the day he got the sweetheart deal for the rape charges. These parents got a state senator to represent their son who shielded him from all consequences. Bowen's parents have chosen to protect their son at all costs, even above the safety of others. Judge Dennis, Prosecutor David Miller, and Senator Brad Hutto, AKA the good old boys who play their cards for Bowen, they are all the problem. What scares me the most is I see so many shocking similarities between Paul Murdoch and Bowen Turner. Both Paul and Bowen were shielded by their parents and the good old boys, and yet their parents still had no control over them. Like Paul, Bowen has a history of getting violent when he drinks. This pattern is disturbing and terrifying. How many times do we have to learn this lesson about what happens to our girls when our system chooses to protect boys like Paul and Bowen? We will continue shining sunlight on this case because accountability matters. In the systems that enabled the criminality in the Murdoch saga, 
also allow Chloe, Dallas, and countless others to be re-victimized with its failures. Stay tuned. We would like to take a moment to thank Katie Gambla for her huge donation to Hopeful Horizons. Katie is an expert in residential sales throughout Beaufort and Jasper counties with her team at Charter One Realty. Katie, thank you for believing in Hopeful Horizons' mission to create safer communities by changing the culture of violence and offering a path to healing. To learn more about Katie, Charter One, or Hopeful Horizons, click the link in the description or call her at 843-605-8862. The Murdoch Murders Podcast is created by me, Mandy Matney, and my fiancé, David Moses. Our executive editor is Liz Farrell. Produced by Luna Shark Productions.